Hello, my name is Wendy Vance. I'm an advocate investigator with Disability Rights Florida. Thank you for joining me today as I present Relationship Violence, Teaching Youth About Healthy Relationships. We are aware that this presentation contains information that can at times be difficult to hear. If you need a break, please pause the presentation, take a break, and then come back and join us. There's some valuable information within this presentation that may be helpful to you. Disability Rights Florida is the state's protection and advocacy agency. We receive funding and have responsibility and authority under nine federal grant programs to protect the rights of Floridians with disabilities. As of April 1, 2021, Disability Rights Florida, in association with several other community partners, applied for a grant from the Department of Justice related to sexual violence against individuals with disabilities. We are currently awaiting the outcome of this grant application and will release additional information about services or activities that may be associated with this grant should we receive the award along with our community partners. Disability Rights Florida is a not-for-profit corporation since 1987, although we have been in existence since 1977. As stated, we are st a statewide agency and we have physical offices in Tallahassee, Tampa, Hollywood, and Gainesville. Satellite offices are available in several other Florida communities. Our mission, Disability Rights Florida advocates, educates, investigates and litigates to protect and advance the rights, dignity, equal opportunity, self-determination, and choices of all. We will cover several topics during the course of this presentation. We're going to begin with the survivor story. Then what is relationship violence? Statistics, warning signs, prevention, barriers to seeking help, and lastly, help is available. We're going to begin this presentation with a survivor story. We're beginning there for two reasons. One, to give you a sense of hope that survival and success post-victimization is possible. And two, understanding that relationship violence extends beyond the context of romantic relationships. Our survivor is Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a sweet young lady who is 17. She does well in school. Well, at least she used to do well in school. About five months ago, a new personal care attendant was assigned to her by the home health care agency that her insurance will cover. Elizabeth needs a personal care attendant, or PCA, because she has both physical and intellectual disabilities that require her to need assistance with feeding, toileting, dressing, transferring in and out of her wheelchair, and many other tasks. Elizabeth's mother has to work because she's raising Elizabeth alone since the death of Elizabeth's father a couple of years ago. Her work pays the bills, but unfortunately, it doesn't give her the time that she needs to take care of Elizabeth by herself. Since she can't be at home in the afternoons, the insurance company approved a personal care attendant for Elizabeth. She gets four hours a day from the time she gets off the bus until mom gets home. This had been working for about the past two years, but then Elizabeth's PCA got married and moved away. The home health agency found another individual to work with Elizabeth. However, since he started about five months ago, Mom has noticed that Elizabeth has started acting differently. Elizabeth stopped using her communication device and really doesn't want to talk to anyone. She spends a lot of time alone. She's been getting reports that Elizabeth is getting upset at school and sometimes violent when her aide tries to take her to the bathroom. She's been having a lot of soiling accidents at home and at school. She's been getting upset when people touch her in any way. 
She's also been getting sick a lot to her stomach. Her mom was just considering taking her to see a gastroenterologist or GI specialist about the sickness when she walked into Elizabeth's room to dress her for school she found that Elizabeth's bed was covered in blood. This was not like the blood that Elizabeth has when she's on her period. This was something entirely different. Mom immediately called 911 and Elizabeth was taken to the ER. Mom stood talking to the ER doctor and he told her that Elizabeth had lost her baby. He suspected that Elizabeth was about four months pregnant. Mom was shocked. Baby? What baby? She can't be pregnant. She's never been alone with a man. And then it hits her. Elizabeth is alone with a man. Four hours a day. But could he do this? He's her caregiver. Could he really? Yes, he did. And it was proven the baby had been the product of the caregiver having raped Elizabeth multiple times over the past four months. After much therapy and time, Elizabeth was able to cope with what happened. She learned to trust and regained her lost skills and was able to get her studies back on track. She graduated high school with honors, and she's now in school studying psychology and expects to graduate in the near future again with honors. She has since entered a healthy adult relationship of her choosing. What is relationship violence? This slide contains a photo of several question marks on a blue background. Relationship violence, AKA. Relationship violence goes by many names, depending on who you're talking to, what agency you're working with, and different factors. So some of the names that you may hear uh, relationship violence referred to as are domestic violence, intimate partner violence, or IVP, dating violence, and interpersonal violence. It is not enough just to know the terms that relationship violence goes by. We need to define relationship violence to understand what it is. Relationship violence is defined by the National Domestic Violence Hotline as a pattern of behavior, not just a one-off incident, although that is not necessarily good having a abusive incident that does not then make this relationship violence. Relationship violence is that pattern of behavior. It happens again and again. It's used by one partner against another partner. And it has a purpose. And its purpose is for maintaining power and control over the other. Relationship violence comes in many forms. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, and disability-specific abuse. Disability-specific abuse. This is a list of common types of things that happen when an abuser is specifically targeting disability in their abuse. No, this is not an all-inclusive list. There may be other types of things that occur, but these are most common. You might have some other types depending on the disability and that kind of thing. But like I said, these are kind of most common what you see, such as disabling medical equipment or assistive technology. This is like making a wheelchair where it won't run or breaking a communication device that kind of thing. Basically, the person making it where the person can't escape or talk to someone else because those devices that they would use to do those functions are no longer available. 
leaving someone in a soiled state. So kind of like what it sounds, a person um, has used the bathroom and the abuser leaves them in that way and, and doesn't clean them up so they're in soiled clothes, you know, that kind of thing. Refusal to allow medical care. The abuser may not allow the person with a disability to seek medical care when they're sick or they're injured um, or just on a regular basis, just basically blocking that medical care. Harming a support animal. And this can mean injuring, not feeding, even sadly enough, uh, killing the animal or, you know, uh, taking them away. Um, and this can be a, a, a service animal that actually performs a service or an emotional support animal, either, either one just, you know, like I said, harming that support animal. Stealing government benefits. Some people who receive benefits have represented a payees. Um, that would give people access to uh, financial resources. Sometimes people have other people on their bank account with them who are not necessarily uh, representative payees, but are joint account holders, and then money can be stolen that way. Uh, sometimes, you know, someone might give you, you might give your debit card to someone and tell them what your number is and to get a certain amount of money and bring it back. Um, of course, this is dangerous even, you know, when you trust someone. Um, you know, I've heard of people who have asked for help with, you know, getting the money out of the ATM that couldn't see, and then the person took more money out of the ATM than was, you know, than they were told to, to get. So that's another form of disability specific abuse. Accusing someone of faking their disability, um, saying that the disability isn't real or that they're making it more, um, you know, than it is, that kind of thing. Telling someone that they are not allowed to have a flare of a chronic condition, meaning they have a condition where sometimes they're sick, sometimes they're not, that times when they're sick is called a flare. And so the abuser might tell the person, you are not allowed to have this flare up. You're not, you can't get sick. And so then the person might not say when they're sick or get the help when they need it um, because, you know, their abuser has told them they're not permitted to do this. Over-medicating someone or inappropriately mixing medication. Sometimes you have situations where someone might be over-medicated or their medication tampered with um, because the abuser doesn't want to have to deal with the person. So it's better, you know, for the abuser if the individual is asleep or, you know, just not able to do anything um, so that, that, you know, they don't have to provide those um, caregiving um, type services. Who is an intimate partner? An intimate partner is someone who you share a sexual relationship with. It can also be a personal care attendant, a family member, or medical providers. For individuals with disability, anyone who has intimate contact with those parts of your body that are generally covered by undergarments or a swimsuit could be considered an intimate partner, basically because they have contact or access to those parts of your body, which normally only you, the, you as a person or your romantic partner or significant other has access to. So any anyone can really fall into this category when you're a person with a disability 
because, you know, other people that would not normally have access to those parts of your body now have access to those parts of your body. Statistics. This slide shows a bar graph with blue, green, yellow, and red bars. It is just a photograph. It's not an actual bar graph plotting any of the information I'm about to provide. How common is relationship violence? This is about violence in general, not specific to individuals with disabilities, but in general, one in three women experience abuse. One in four men experience abuse. One in 10 high school students experience abuse from a romantic partner and about half a million adults die each year due to interpersonal violence. Prevalence toward individuals with disabilities, slide one of two. When looking at prevalence data as it relates to relationship violence and individuals with disabilities, we experience some limitations. The research on this topic has been far more limited than it is with the general population, so there are fewer studies to pull data from. Inside of that, the internal limitations of the studies related to uh, requirements imposed by funding agencies or by uh, bo boards of professional or ethical standards, then of course there are the limitations imposed by those who are willing and able to participate in the studies. But although that, that should not detract from what I really want you to understand here. First, that the general idea that abuse does occur and it occurs at a higher rate than we would normally maybe think about it. So, so this information may be contrary to something you have believed or have been led to believe about violence as it intersects with individuals with disability. From the 2020 National Coalition Against Domestic Violence fact sheet, it is estimated that women with disabilities are at 40% greater risk of physical violence. 80% of women with disabilities have been sexually assaulted and of that group, 47% of this group report being assaulted on more than 10 occasions. 48% of abuse of individuals with disabilities involve individuals who are elderly or who cannot care for themselves. Children with disabilities are twice as likely to be physically abused and almost two times as likely to be sexually abused. Prevalence toward individuals with disabilities, slide two of two. Powers and Oswald, 2004, reviewed several of the relationship violence studies and found that about 40 to 67 percent of women with disabilities experience abuse at some point in their lifetime, and about 44 to 60. 5% of men with disabilities experience abuse at some point in their lifetime. A 2015 United States Department of Health and Human Services study found that men with disabilities are more likely to be the victim of psychological abuse and stalking than other forms of relationship violence. Abuse by personal care assistant. Slide one of two. Before we discuss the numbers in, in regard to categories of abuse that occur, please note that this is not a commentary on all personal care assistance 
we are in no way saying that all personal care assistants are going to abuse you or your loved one. The purpose here is to let you know that such abuse exists, that it should not exist, and if it's happening to you, then that is something that needs to be dealt with. So again, nothing is meant to be disparaging about personal care assistant. It just, these things sometimes happen, and so we want to make you aware that this type of abuse does exist and should be reported. Um, so having said that, I just want to give you a few stats about um, how often things happen and kind of what things happen. Among women who report personal care assistant abuse, 49% report time theft, meaning they are the uh, personal care assistant arrives late or leaves early. 41% report verbal abuse, 36% having their money stolen, 14% having equipment immobilized or broken, 14% medication tampering, 14% physical abuse, and 6% sexual abuse. Abuse by personal care assistant two of two. Among men who report personal care assistant abuse, 34% report time, time theft, which is the arriving late or leaving early, 44% verbal abuse, 12% having their money stolen, 10% having equipment immobilized or broken, 14.9% medication tampering, 9% physical abuse, and 8% sexual abuse. So what do we need to then look for if it is you being abused or if it's your loved one being abused? What are the signs? What things do we need to look for? <clears throat> Warning signs of abuse, slide one of three. So when you're looking at abuse, you, you probably think about things like seeing bruises or having broken bones. And those are all, yes, signs that abuse may be occurring. But there are other signs and things that you can look out for that may be you wouldn't normally think of or you know may not be as obvious as say the black eye or the broken bone so here are just a, a few in general per the national domestic violence hotline website some things that might be warning signs are discouraging you or your loved one from visiting with family and friends telling you that you can never do anything right, showing extreme jealousy of your friends and time spent away from the abuser, demeaning, insulting, or shaming you, preventing you from making your own decisions, controlling household finances, pressuring you regarding sex, pressuring you to use drugs and or alcohol. Warning signs of abuse, slide two of three. These are some additional general warning signs. Intimidating you with looks or threats, insulting you as a parent, intimidating you with weapons, destroying your home or belongings. There may also be some additional warning signs inherent in the abuser and some of the things that have been reported in studies that have been found is um, people who are overly jealous. They may seem manipulative. You may have heard stories about them abusing past partners. If they abuse animals, sometimes this can be a sign. And um, many of the studies have found that um, the 
victims reported that their abuser moved in with them very quickly. So they weren't in relationship very long and the abuser moved into their home very quickly. Warning signs of abuse, slide three of three. This slide is specific to disability because in addition to the general warning signs that you may get, which are common regardless of disability, there may be also some very disability specific warning signs that you could see uh, that are occurring. And you may recognize some of these um, from the story that I told you earlier in the presentation. And you may can see, you know, the warning signs that Elizabeth's mom um, may have seen. So as far as disability specific, sudden inability to perform daily living tasks that impact health, safety, and well-being. Sudden fear of a person or place. Regression to childlike behaviors. Sudden unusual interest or knowledge of sexual matters. Malnourishment, poor skin condition, or bed sores. Now, we know what the warning signs are, so we know that once you have warning signs, abuse is already occurring. So what can we do in regard to prevention? How do we stop it from happening before it even starts? How can abuse be prevented? Slide one of two. Prevention strategies proposed in the 2004 Powers and Oswald study include such things as educating individuals with disabilities, how to identify abuse, and how to get help. By coming to this presentation today and spending some time with us as we explore this topic, you are helping yourself to prevent abuse. You can take this information and share with others and continue the cycle of preventing abuse. Educating individuals with disabilities that they have the right to be safe in all relationships and that abuse is not the fault of the victim. No matter what anyone says, you have the right to be safe. You have the right for your body to be touched only in that way that you want it to be touched. And you have the right to say no. It is not your fault. Not one bit of it. This is a choice made by someone else. And you are the victim. So from me to you, please do not blame yourself. Person Controlled and Directed Services. One of my favorite quotes from the Powers and Oswald study was, people are best able to main control, maintain control over their safety when they control their services. Because when you give someone the decision to hire and fire, that changes the balance of power. You work for me. I hire you. I decide if I want to fire you. It changes the balance of power. At this point, we have an imbalance of power where <clears throat> those people that are hired work for another agency. They don't work for you directly, don't necessarily report to you directly. So you're kind of subject to that system. Whereas if we give the person with a disability, the power to choose who they want and um, have that higher and fire power, like I said, it changes that power dynamic. So having that person controlled and directed service. Enhance community service centers and the police departments with the tools needed to help and support victims with disabilities. Revamp personal assistance salaries and benefit schedules to attract more quality and experienced candidates. 
encourage individuals with disabilities to have multiple personal assistant providers. How can abuse be prevented? Slide two of two. Prevention strategies proposed in the Powers and Oswald study continued. Make backup personal assistant providers available to all individuals who receive these services. Create coalitions of service providers such as independent living center, consumer groups, self-advocacy organizations, victim services, etc. to complete training, support, and assistance activities. Provide a 24-hour crisis line staffed with individuals who are experienced in helping people with disabilities and provide emergency services such as specialized transportation and interpreter services. Barriers to seeking help. Oftentimes we may ask the question, why does this individual stay in the relationship? Why don't they seek help? Why don't they get out? That's a complex question. Some of it involving personal issues or sometimes there are systemic barriers. Some of those barriers increase when you add disability as a cross section with abuse. Many of our systems have design flaws inside of them that create a barrier. And so those are some of the things that we're going to talk about today. What prevents accurate abuse reporting? Slide one of two. If you will recall from earlier in the presentation, we discussed that there are limitations in the studies that are available related to prevalence data for individuals with disabilities and relationship violence. Part of that is because individuals are either unable or unwilling to participate in some of these studies. This relates to the barriers that exist within systems and for people personally, whether it is a fear that this um, you know, barrier exists or the barrier actually exists, it doesn't matter either way whether it really exists or is perceived to be, it creates a barrier for people so they don't report and then we wind up with underreported situations. And so I want to share with you a few of the personal barriers to think about. Um, so some personal barriers may be fear of loss of support services. Someone may be very fearful that even though this person is abusing them, if they're reported that they will not be replaced, um, there may not be somebody to replace them, especially if they're in an area where it's difficult to get services anyway. They may be fearful that they will be moved into a group home and, or facility instead of being able to live independently if they lose their support services. An individual may feel embarrassed or they may feel emasculated. An individual may have a lack of skills or the ability to independently seek services. They may not have a voice and if the person that is abusing them has destroyed their communication device, they may, of course, further be without a voice. Fear of not being believed. There is this misconception that some people may have that people with disabilities are not abused, that people would not do that to someone with a disability. And so because that is a thought that's out there, sometimes it can affect people and make them feel that they won't be believed. Um, in some cases, some individuals with disabilities have reported in the studies that 
they felt like nobody was going to believe, say, that they were sexually assaulted because they feel like people see them as asexual beings, meaning that they have no um, sexual attraction either for people or in themselves. And so their fear was that they would not be believed because people just didn't believe that anyone would want to sexually assault them. So, um, you know, just opinions that are out there impact people with disabilities in their feeling as to whether or not they're going to be believed. And then that manifests itself into people just not reporting it. Um, fear of losing their children. There's a lot of fear out there among people with disabilities that I have this disability and I might lose my children if I intersect with other agencies such as Department of Children and Families or um, child, other child welfare you know, agencies um, because they may think as a person with a disability, I'm not competent to raise my children or that kind of thing. So because that fear is already there and then now you add abuse onto it and the abuser may have told this person that they are not a good parent or, you know, criticize their parenting skills, there'll be a lot of layers in that. So that's also a fear. Fear of losing a pet or support animal. They could feel like their animal would be taken from them. Some, um, some agencies that issue different service animals have clauses in their contract that you as the user don't um, retain ownership of this animal that, that they do and they can pull it if they feel like this animal's safety is at jeopardy. So if you can't keep yourself safe, then it may be thought hey, you can't keep this animal safe. So they may be afraid that they would lose their animal because of these, you know, clauses that exist. So that's all, these are all things to think about when you are trying to think about your loved one, um, you know, and what they may be going through so that you could help them. And also, you know, if you're the person with the disability, you may be feeling these feelings um, as well. What prevents accurate abuse reporting? Slide two of two. In addition to the personal barriers or fears that people may experience due to the messaging that they have received or concerns that they just have because of the limitations in services that are in their community already, there are some systemic barriers that exist within the programs and services themselves, which limit or prevent people from, with disabilities from using those services. And then by extension, having the abuse accurately reported. Some of these systemic barriers include such things as lack of accessible services, having services that are physically accommodating to someone or that can be reached via public transportation that many people with disabilities depend on. There's a lack of that. Lack of accessible information or education. Having those materials that are available to the general public available in other formats such as braille, on tape, sign language. Lack of appropriately trained staff and or availability of medical equipment or accommodations inside of facilities and programs. Lack of regular abuse screening for people with disabilities. As we discussed earlier, there is this concept within society that people with disabilities would not be abused. It's just something you don't do. And some of the studies that were reviewed for this presentation found that there was dismissal from medical providers related to 
abuse or the consideration of screening someone for abuse. Um, disability service agency staff not taking abuse reports seriously also plays into this. Agencies not proactively offering help for abuse victims. Shortage of qualified, dependable personal care assistance. Despite the barriers that exist, either through societal messaging or systemic barriers, help is available. If you are a person with a disability and you are experiencing any of the abusive behaviors which we discussed today in defining relationship violence, please know that there is help for you. If someone is hurting you physically, if they are touching your body in a way that you do not want them touching you, if they are harming you or forcing you to do things that you don't want to do sexually or taking substances into your body or tampering with your medication, if you are being kept from your family and friends, if your equipment is being uh, disabled, these are not signs of a healthy relationship. These are unhealthy relationships. Healthy relationships do not attempt to maintain control over you. They do not steal from you. They do not abuse your body or force you to commit sexual acts against your will. If you are experiencing these things again, I just want to reiterate help is available and we want to provide you with some resources. Where to find help? You can find help by contacting the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 800-799-7233 or by going to www.thehotline.org. You may also seek assistance through the Florida Department of Family and Children's. Their number it, for the abuse hotline is 800-962-2873 or you can get reach out to them online at reportabuse.dcf.state.fl.us. Also included as a separate handout from this presentation are contact information for um, the domestic violence shelters across the state. The next two slides are references. They include references to the studies that I have talked about today and to the National Domestic Violence Hotline and also the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence and the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, Common Signs and Symptoms of Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation so that you can explore some additional um, signs of abuse to be on the lookout for. 2022 Public Input Survey. Your input matters to us. Please visit the link below between now and July 31st, 2021 to complete our annual public input planning survey. Your responses will help us plan our goals, priorities, and objectives for 2022. You can visit us online at disabilityrightsflorida.org backslash survey. We are Disability Rights Florida, located at 2473 Care Drive, Suite 200, Tallahassee, Florida, 32308. Our main number is 800-342-0823, and our TDD line is 800 
346-4127. You may also reach out and check out our resources at disabilityrightsflorida.org. Thank you so much for joining me today as I presented information on relationship violence. I hope that you have found this presentation educational and helpful. Thank you so much 